Palette to Palette with Robert St. John and Wyatt Waters is made possible by a generous contribution from Sanderson Farms. Additional funding is provided by this and other public television stations and from viewers like you. Thank you. You know, Florence is probably my favorite city in all of Europe. It's the birthplace of the Renaissance. The Renaissance, which affected the world from that point forward, started right there. And it started at the doors of the baptistry, which is right across from the Duomo. And the Duomo is what people visually associate with Florence. It's the centerpiece. It was, it's visually the thing that you connect most to what Florence is. It's the iconic structure. Brunelleschi's dome right there that is the largest brick and mortar dome still to this day. An architectural marvel right there in the middle of town. And, and the crazy thing about it, you were born in Florence. I grew up in Florence. Mississippi. <laughs> but it was Florence, it was Florence. Yeah. And they also have a dome. It's, it's not Brunelleschi's, it's Jerry's. Jerry's Catfish Dome <laughs> on Highway 49. I'll pass it off. And it's, it's... It's a dome. It's a dome. If you want two Americans who love Italy, we're your guys. You know, I really fell in love with Italy before I even went there just through the paintings I studied. Neither one of us are Italian experts. We mangle the language almost in every sentence, but we love this place. Turning people on to the food, to the culture, mm -hmm. to the art, and just the entire experience. It's a great place. We're still learning about Italy. It's great to watch people experience this. We went over there and we fell in love with it. And we love sharing it with other people. In 2011, you and I covered all of Italy working on our book, An Italian Palette, from the southernmost tip of Sicily to the Alps. And the amazing thing to me is that whole time, you know, my family and I were going into museums right and left and going to look at this beautiful painting in this place and that place, and you didn't catch any of it. You know, I kept, I kept thinking, if I do a good job this time, I can come back. If I don't do a good job this time, this will be the last time I'm in, in Europe, you know, so. Folks, he painted. That's what he did. He painted the whole time. We were there 10 weeks, 70 days, seven of which were travel days. So in those 63 days, Wyatt finished 128 paintings. Amazing. And that's why he didn't go to museums. So it's been one of my life's ambitions to get Wyatt Waters into the Uffizi, which is one of the great museums in all of the world. And that was my wish on this trip, is to finally get you into the Uffizi. <laughs> Well, the museum art, the museum art is great there, but there's a, lot, there's a lot of great art that's just simply on the walls there. In fact, the word graffiti is an Italian word. And there, there were things uh, we saw along the way that were painted by artists who have no name. We'll, we'll, we'll never know them. Yeah, there's some on street signs all throughout the city. There's one artist who kind of does his work and leaves his mark on street signs in a very artistic way. Mm -hmm. The graffiti artists in Florence, Italy, are some of the best in the world. They're really good. But you've got the Arno River, which is kind of the lifeblood of that city running through the town. And in the old days, you had to settle beside a river. And that river is as famous as any river in all of mm -hmm. Italy, but it has the most famous bridge in all of Italy Ponte too, Vecchio. and that's the Ponte Vecchio. But the Ponte Vecchio, there's that, uh, you know, the Medici's didn't want to walk among the commoners, so they made themselves a second story sidewalk. Now, Hitler bombed Florence, and he bombed Florence pretty hard, took out all the bridges except the Ponte Vecchio. And, and he instructed uh, his generals not to take out the Ponte Vecchio, I think probably not because he had a heart or anything, but he wanted the Ponte Vecchio when he thought 
he was going to take over Italy. Well, glad it didn't go that way. Yeah, we're all glad. So the Ponte Vecchio was built in the 1300s, and at the time, it were, they were all butchers. And uh, the butchers cut the meat and, and cut stuff up and just threw it overboard into the river. <laughs> and uh, it got kind of nasty and it got kind of stinky. And um, the Medici family actually had Vasari, the architect, build a corridor that runs from the palace to the city government and uh, goes actually by the Uffizi Museum uh, called the Vasari Corridor. And uh, it used to be open to the public. It is closed now, and we didn't get to go on this trip, but it has a very famous scene in the Dan Brown movie. So the butchers aren't there anymore, but what's there are jewelry stores mm -hmm. and silversmiths. And Mr. Peruzzi uh, was the first building right there. He's a silversmith. And my grandmother, back in the late 1940s, early 50s, uh, was in Florence and had a silver service made for my mother and father when they got married. Oh. And they make everything right there. And while I was there, I went in and visited and uh, have, have since taken my kids there. And it's a very special uh, part of our family. And we have that silver service there from Mr. Peruzzi. And I think, I think Vecchio means gold. I'm pretty sure it does. Search the Google. It's not, it's not just the jewelry, it's also the writing. The, uh, the, the fellow who wrote Pinocchio is from Florence, and Pinocchio is known as the little wooden son of Tuscany. Yeah, you got it. So in Florence, there's a statue of a boar, Cingali, as they call it, and um, the legend goes, if you rub the nose of the boar, then you will return to Florence. How boring. <laughs> but it's worked because I've rubbed that boar's nose every time and I keep going back to Florence. So there. So Florence is filled with artwork and antiquities. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you look, really. And during World War II, the Germans were bombing Italy like crazy. But you've got like the David. Up until 1870, the David was outside on public display. Uh, but sometime in the 1870s, they moved it inside. And so what are you gonna do? I mean, that building could get bombed. They built a brick silo around the David, filled it with dirt, and it, it worked, amazing. but the David didn't get hurt. Now where the David was, there's another David, and that's known as the outside David, and I'd seen that one. I'd painted that one, but I'd not seen the real David. I'd not seen the David. That was the first painting you did in Florence, was yes, actually it was. of the outside David. Yes, and the light was only on that. From a previous day, I had seen that. It was in the shadow except for a very brief period around noon, and I arranged to be there just when that shaft of light hit it. You know, there are small trattorias and ristorantes and osterias all over the Tuscan countryside. And most of them are run by families. Sometimes it's a, a father and a son and a mama in the kitchen, but sometimes it's husband and wife. And one of our favorite restaurants in that area, La Gramola, is run by a husband and wife, Massimo and Cecilia. She's in the kitchen, he's out front. Uh, he takes care of the wine, she takes care of the food. They also make great ravioli. And if you're gonna have anyone teach you how to make ravioli, you need someone who makes good ravioli to teach you how to make good So y'all got to learn to make great ravioli. Yeah, she makes great ravioli.
What people are amazed about is there's not a lot that goes into pasta. It's water, it's flour, it's egg, maybe a little bit of salt, and, and that's what it takes. But there's some skill involved, and I love watching people who have never made pasta before make homemade pasta because there's this realization all of a sudden that, hey, I can do this, <laughs> and they can. Because the ravioli you make this morning is going to be the same ravioli we eat tonight. So tonight's dinner is not in my hands. Tonight's dinner is in your hands. So the fate of our meal is up to you and how well you do. But I have faith in you. I think y'all are going to do great. And so I love it because we go over and we let them make ravioli and tortellini and then we come back later to the same restaurant and we have Ticilia cook the ravioli and That's tortellini. That's what I like. And we sit around <laughs> and we eat what they made earlier in the day. I really like painting things that are indicative of the place, but there are some things that are indicative of the place that are also very universal. And I can't think of a more universal subject than a clothesline. It's, it's, it's old world, it's, it's something I grew up with, it's something that's still in practice in, in, in Italy. So that's, that's what I painted that day. It's indicative of every place. Yeah. Plus, they use a lot of electricity. Uh, Italy buys a lot of their electricity from France, and so the less power they have to use, the better. Ergo, yeah. hanging laundry out to dry. The thing about this, though, it's a very time-sensitive thing. You just don't leave the clothes on the line the whole time. The started the painting was setting up, getting ready to go. The woman walks off to the clothesline and feels it. I know what she's doing. She's feeling, are these clothes damp? or they dry, should I take them off? And I was just cringing. I thought, I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to get this painting done. Every time something like that happens on location, it really gets you excited and worried and your adrenaline starts flowing. Fortunately, she walked away and decided they weren't dry enough. And I had the time I needed to make a painting. A little dramatic tension there in the middle of it, but it adds to the art, doesn't it? Yes. I love that painting, by the way. So going from something as simple and basic as clothes hanging on a line, we go to the Westminster Abbey of Florence, they call it Santa Croce, which is a great, beautiful old Gothic cathedral right there in the heart of Florence. We 
like to call this church the Italian Westminster Abbey, the real pantheon of Italy. This is the largest Franciscan church we have in Italy. The building dates back 1294. In Santa Croce, we have 300 tombs, and we have Michelangelo and Galileo Galilei, the great astronomer. Michelangelo died in Rome at the age of 89 on February 1564. Galileo was born in Pisa on February 1564. Same year, same month, one died, the other was born. Now the two great men are buried facing each other in the same place. And tell me if that is not a strange coincidence. Huh? Galileo was buried there. He was buried somewhere else before, but then they dug him up and decided they would like, you know, honor him, bury him again. Everybody's buried there at Santa Croce except Jim Croce. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Galileo was excommunicated, actually. And, and stayed banned, basically, but it wasn't until the 1990s that they brought him back in. Wow. They finally figured out, okay, this guy, maybe he knew a little bit about what he was talking about. Yeah. <laughs> the Earth became round in 1990s. <laughs> Who knew? In 1966, there was a massive flood. I'm talking about about 10 feet through the streets. Unbelievable. The Arno River flooded the entire city of Florence. Mud. Yeah, in Santa Croce, there was a massive painting of a Last Supper. There's several Last Supper paintings in Italy. Obviously in Milan, Da Vinci's Last Supper is there, but there are many other ones. And there was a huge one in Santa Croce that ended up underwater in 1966. The painting had been completely damaged during the flood, so they had to make a hard job of restoration, uh, starting with the wood and then to the, to the colors. Right now, for this painting, there is a whole mechanism, do you see? It can be lifted in case of another flood. I remember seeing that in National Geographic, and it left such a huge impression on me when I was mm -hmm. a kid. It, it wasn't just water, it was mud. Yeah. But that crucifix remained immersed in the mud for one day. It's so clear, uh, the damage caused by that flood. There are other graves. There's Dante, there's Michelangelo. It's just, a, uh, it's, it's an enormous, uh, assembling of Italian uh, personalities. It's like a shrine to the Italian masters right there in one building. And the bodies of these people are not inside the coffins. They are underneath the floor. Who knows what is left? Because we had several floods through the centuries. <laughs> we wonder what is left uh, of the bodies of these people. Ricardo knows his stuff, man. He is so passionate about his city. For you, this is Florence. For me, this is Firenze. Florentines are very proud of where they come from. They called it Florencia, the city of the flowers, the flourishing one. Passion and knowledge always give you a great experience. Yes. These are among the last works by Giotto. These are the most famous frescoes we have in this church. Everybody was drawn, especially to Michelangelo, because there's always the debate, you know, Michelangelo, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Leonardo. In Florence, it appears that Michelangelo has got the, got the popular yeah, support. I think you're right. Leonardo up north, Michelangelo down south. Before we go, excuse me only one second, but I want to show you something else briefly. Ricardo is so passionate about his city, and you know, we only have a set amount of time to be with him, and it kills him when he, because we've got to, we've got to get from Santa Croce to Uffizi, and he passes 20 things that he'd love to stop and tell us about. I'm afraid that we have to go. I and mean, you can kind of just hear the, oh, I wish I could tell you about that, but he doesn't. Oh, he loves the city. Yeah, he does. You know, we've been over there when all sorts of stuff was happening in demonstrations and things like that. We just, we ended up passing a communist uh, demonstration that day. And, it's a real uh, party there. You never know what you're gonna see in Florence. Italy.
you pretty much know what you're gonna see in Florence, Mississippi. <laughs> you got a point. And that's all they have at the other Florence. So I'm finally gonna get Wyatt to the Uffizi. It's taken years. And just before we go in. Let's just squeeze one more in. He sees something and he wants to paint it <laughs> and we don't get him in yet. But we're almost, I just had to get that painting done. So I'm outside, I'm working on this painting and somebody, I'm, I'm, there are Arno's to the left and the Ponte Vecchio's in the background, the arches here, it's really, it's very classical and you really want to paint it. And these school kid, kids come up and someone had taught me, I was trying to ask them about what a word for cool was. My name is and I, was, I wanted to use that word, so I used that word, except I got one of the letters wrong on there and it means something very, very different than cool. You were trying to make a connection and communicate with them. I wanted to relate them. to them. They were saying in broken English, I like your painting. And I said, see, but is it, and I used the word that I thought was the word for cool, except I got one of the letters wrong. It's like the worst word you could say. Yes. So, so Wyatt's there yeah, talking thinking, you know? to these Italian school children, and he said, "We the word's so bad, we can't say it on the TV, not even the Italian version And I didn't it. mean it either. And so he said, oh, is this painting me? And those kids were like, oh, look at <laughs> this dirty American. They remembered me. So to the Italian school children that I said that word to, my apologies. So we finished the painting, and finally, after years, I got Wyatt Waters into the Uffizi Gallery. That was worth the wait. Going through the museum, you get to see all these great things. You see Botticelli's Birth of Venus, which is Venus on the half shell, but that's this unbelievable, beautiful, large painting. And, it, and, and you get to see and stand in that. And you, you, then you walk around the corner and there's a, the only painting that we can 100% attribute to Michelangelo. And it looks like it was painted yesterday. It's so fresh. And that, that was maybe something I didn't expect. Um, how, how vivid the colors were. And then you go around another corner and you come to this uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, drawing, a, a sketch of a painting. It's not finished, but it, you get an idea into how he thought. And so many of his things were not finished. And of the mastery. The Uffizi is one of the great museums in all of Europe. Really, in, in the all, world. all the yeah. world. Yeah. It, was a, it was a great thing to be at the Uffizi. It was a... I got to share this with my girlfriend. It was, it was a wonderful thing. I, I don't know, I, you have anticipation about what it's going to be, and, but until you're there, you don't really know it. And now I know it. This is why you go, you don't just look at textbooks. And I got to check one off the list. Wyatt did the Uffizi. Grazie. Prego. So we went back to La Gromola that night with our group, a fun-loving group. We ate the ravioli and tortellini they had made earlier in the day. And then one of the great experiences uh, I've witnessed in an Italian restaurant over the years, especially one in Italy, happened. And we're all sitting around and then this crew was uh, full of wine, having a good time. <laughs> and we had some uh, folks there from the Mississippi Gulf Coast. One of them, Gene, got up, started playing the piano. And then John got up and started to sing. We didn't know what he was about to sing. We didn't know what was gonna happen. None had been planned, none rehearsed. And he started singing. And this group of people from all over the country, some from California, from Florida, a lot from Mississippi, chimed in and sang every yes, word. And the whole, the restaurant was rocking. Our friend Marina was over there and you, the look on her face when we were singing, she was just amazed that everybody knew every word to the song. <laughs> and it was one of these things we hadn't planned. And all the Italians that were eating in the restaurant were looking around, they thought this very American thing that was happening, uh, they weren't bothered by it. I was a little worried at first, you know, are we being rude in the restaurant or whatever? But they seemed to, you know, appreciate and love it. And and they did another song and uh, it was just a, it was a, it was a great moment.
There are a lot of ways to end the day, and it had been a day. World-class museums, Florentine steak dinner, you know, rousing sing-alongs. But the way to end that day is at the Piazza di Michelangelo with this beautiful view over Florence at night. You know, sometimes you just want to be, and you get into a space that has that much history and that much beauty, and just to be there and experience it at the end of the day made it the perfect day. It's the best view. Beautiful. seen on today's program, plus many others, are featured in the An Italian Palette Cookbook. This beautiful volume also includes authentic Italian recipes. An Italian Palette Cookbook. Palette to Palette with Robert St. John and Wyatt Waters is made possible by a generous contribution from Sanderson Farms. Additional funding is provided by this and other public television stations, and from viewers like you. Thank you.